in the Public Health Policy and Social Sciences Department at Swansea University in Wales, UK. And so thanks for being with us, uh, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I wanted to first ask you um, what your research is about and how it is you've become uh, a commentator about state censorship and that sort of thing. Um, so I, my research is about um, social problems generally and how we talk about social problems um, and in particular how um, more and more social problems have been emotionalized, so talked about through the language of emotion and emotions themselves have more and more been set up as problems or as things that um, that policymakers should be concerned about, should do something about. Um, so I wrote a book published in 2015 looking at the construction of happiness as a social problem, as something that you know schools need to teach, that policymakers need to consciously promote, that requires intervention and expertise in order to get right. Um, and that attempted to, it was a sort of discourse that attempted to explain a huge range of social issues through misguided quests for happiness and, and posited the solution for those issues in guiding people back to the correct um, um, you know meaning of happiness or the correct way that happiness should be pursued um, and that might seem a bit odd but you know I'll give you an example so during the um, the economic crisis um, claims makers or advocates for happiness would say things like well we wouldn't have had an economic crisis if we didn't focus so much on GDP and in, or consumption or buying houses we couldn't afford and instead Oriented, reoriented back to the true meaning of happiness, which is from within or from your family or whatever sort of romantic sort of things that they sort of posited. Um, and that uh, might sound quite convincing. Um, and so I go into why why that became a very powerful way of understanding social problems. And it's a quite silly way of understanding social problems because um, although it has a nice sound to it, it has an intuitive kind of logic, um, ultimately, many issues um, can't be reduced to misguided quests for happiness. They're deep sort of structural issues, um, behavior that appears quite illogical at the aggregate level of society might be quite logical when it comes down to the behaviors of individuals involved. Um, and so it's ma mainly about telling these nice kinds of stories. Um, so that was what that book was about. Um, and then I'm, I've got another book coming out um, <laughs> Next year, I've I've been on maternity leave um, since I started the book um, twice, so it's been delayed several times. Um, but this this one uh, is about um, how there are actually many different um, um, problem orientations that preceded happiness, like self esteem. You know, um, that said the very, that that told a very similar story. That if we could just promote self esteem, we would not have ch uh, teenage pregnancy. We would ha not have uh, educational inequalities. Um, feminists said it would b bring down the patriarchy. You know, and so it's this this idea that if you just promote the right emotions, then we'll solve all these problems. So I'm kind of going into explaining how that happens, and I go through a number of examples: self esteem, happiness, well being, mindfulness, uh, and then I try to explain why that happened and I kind of root it in the subject and the loss of the of faith in the sort of human subject's ability to adequately manage one's own life and manage one's own emotions. It's it's problematic isn't it because it's it's really a recipe for social engineering. It's like yeah. this this line that allows the state to focus on and construct a way of seeing ourselves even and of understanding our place in society but that is along the line of what the state wants and how it wants to manage and control things. I, I you know, that's my sense that I get from when you describe your research, uh, that it, it, it's, it's a social engineering agenda in a sense. Well, in a way, but it's not just coming from the state. It's like, it's, it's a lot of different groups in society that have lost any other vocabulary for making sense of social problems. And so for them, you know, the only solution is social engineering because it's become sort of common sense that once people reach adulthood, they can't be convinced of anything. No one ever changes their mind. And so if you want to solve a problem, you have to go into childhood. <laughs> you have to um, go into schools and so on. Uh, and it has, you know, this idea has been around for a long time. There's nothing new about it, really. Right. Uh, it, it, you know, you could look at um, social pathology, understandings of social 
problems where um, you look at the the individual as the sort of diseased outgrowth of an otherwise healthy society. Well, we, it's a sort of rehashing of that old way of thinking about social problems that also fed into eugenics. Um, but it's it's a sort of kinder orientation, but, and it says society is sick, and we have to sort of inoculate people from the yeah. ill effects of society, or the sickening effects. Yes, but to achieve this loss of vocabulary of of people. Uh, you have to have a public education system. So I would imagine that historically, uh, the ability to do that for the state to come in and uh, create a situation where people even lose their vocabulary to think about themselves and 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 what they are, uh, would have come into play uh, with the with the surge in public education that 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 came in historically. Because I would imagine that when, uh, in the States anyway, when there was this fragmentation of how you learned and where you learned, that there would be a lot more different views of who you are and what you're able to, you know, what motivates you and kind of a self uh, sense of yourself. Would, there would have been more variety at that time, I would imagine. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that's part of that. I mean, I, I think that the loss of vocabulary really came from the end of history. So the idea after the fall of the Berlin Wall that there's no alternative, this is it. Um, and so capitalism no longer has to justify itself against the communist threat, and there is no communist threat. <laughs> so, um, so if you want to sort of try to make sense of issues in a sort of deeper way, uh, you're kind of at a loss. And so if you want to talk to people, you can't talk to people through the language of like libertarianism or communism or socialism or or even Christianity or Islam. You know, you're not or you can't say do this because God said so. You're going to say do this because it's good for your health. Uh, it'll make you happy. It's good right. for your mental health. It, it'll achieve well-being. And but so you, that you, you've nailed a, a particular point in history, which I think is crucial is the 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 fall of the Soviet Union, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been tied to many movements that have been dumped upon us as replacements, in a sense. Uh, that includes environmentalism. It mm. includes uh, anti-racism, like against the language that would produce, you know, a reaction of racism. Um, and it also includes gender equality. All of these features were, were um, blown up artificially immediately in coincidence with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I did a study where I looked at uh, frequency of these phrases in the literature and in films and so on. It's very evident, and, and also in the scientific literature, it's very evident that these things came into play as, as a direct timing with the fall of the Soviet Union. So I think there is an important, I, I, I would tend to agree from my perspective, from my research, that there is this important link there to be made. But also happiness, if we, if we focus on happiness, um, then you, there, there is a part of, some people would say, well, then we have to be concerned about the words that are being said by people because words can induce feelings of not being happy or of being sad or what are called negative emotions. That's, that's, that's an interesting new concept, negative emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, so it, it becomes also the quest for happiness in a sense is used to justify, um, censorship like and and political correctness and control and of the language would you agree with that yeah i mean not just happiness i mean happiness gave way to well-being and well-being gave way to mental health and i've seen mental health being used in that way a lot um mm -hmm. in fact i think prince harry or, or was it prince william said recently something like you know the tabloids are giving them a hard time at the moment and he was like how dare they say this particularly at a time when people are struggling with their mental health and i thought that was a very interesting use of that um you'd mentioned before about um you know anti-racism and so on coming up around the time of the fall of the berlin wall um i think what's happened is that um what used to be very united kinds of movements um fragmented as well into all these different single issue movements so then the left became about well i'm for stopping the war and i'm for saving the whales and i'm for the environment and i'm an anti-racist instead of having this sort of unified kind of way of making sense of social issues in a structural way that you know that that carried all of these things maybe together or saw these things as an outgrowth of one common structural issue instead they were sort of competing against each other um and also uh when that happened you you uh, you saw for instance like anti-racism take this turn um away from universalism 
Um, because if you wanted to have anti-racism that was based on universalism, um, that is very much a sort of the, the continuation of a, of a very liberal, liberal project. Um, but that liberal project has more or less collapsed. And now anti-racism very much has come out of uh, the, the, what the, the form that anti-racism uh, takes today is very much a continuation of the romantic reaction to the Enlightenment rather than the continuation of the Enlightenment. Um, so this idea of like, you know, if you think about the um, Haitian Revolution, um, this was the continuation of that liberal project. You know, um, uh, was it CLR James said something like um, the French Revolution started in France and finished in Haiti so that you, to take it to its logical conclusion, if you, you if we're, you're serious here about the universal rights of men, then so too can slaves be free. They must be free. Um, and that was that continuation of making yes. that enlightenment promise come real. That's what you needed to have another revolution to make those mm -hmm. things um, uh, come to fruition. But, the, but, uh, there's but been now a, that's there's, Yeah, I was going to say, but there's been kind of a... Uh, Anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Well, the, but but the, so there's been this this division away from these fundamental real issues about our bodies and and our place in the economy and so on, and towards I would say superficial things like this notion that words that wound, you know. Yeah. And I think I think big movements that occurred in in the legal era, such as critical race theory, led us to this this division where you have to co be concerned about words and what people say, kind of like the racism of expression, you know. Um, th that that's something that's of great concern to the Ontario Civil Liberties Association is how words have acquired this incredible importance. And recently, um, I saw that uh, in comment on social media, you used the expression which really caught my attention, which was that cancel culture is toxic. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really captures something important because it used to be not long ago that freedom of expression was understood as an essential feature in a society to, to combat a uh, kind of growing influence of the elite and a, and a march towards totalitarianism, that the way, one effective rule that would allow you to combat that is to have freedom of expression, a, a true, it's, it's both a human right of the individual to express, but it was also a fundamental right to, to uh, have influence in society and to combat against this, this growing, always growing march of more influence by the elite. And so it, we've, we've moved from um, understanding the fundamental importance of freedom of expression towards what we are acquiring today, which is of great concern to our association. I was wondering if you could speak to that problem. Yeah, I think um, we were in a situation culturally where we're finding it very difficult to imagine expanding and generalizing good things. And instead, we seem to want to democratize the bad things. <laughs> so the fact that uh, freedom of expression is, it is unequally shared in society, right? Not everybody has access to the same platforms and so on. Um, instead of saying, well, let's move forward to a situation, let's fight for a situation in which everyone truly does have freedom of expression, um, where we do see uh, a more thorough representation of viewpoints, it becomes, well, I don't have freedom of expression, you shouldn't either, right? Or instead of a situation where nobody should experience racism, it's kind of like, or no one should be reduced to their skin color. It's like, everybody should be reduced to their skin color. I'm reduced to my skin color, so you should too. And that's, that strikes me as very backward, um, that the, the, the movement that we should be going, we, we should absolutely accept that there are inequalities in society and that and that, that is real. Um, but we should be trying to move forward to a future in which we, are, we can truly share things together as human beings in a fundamentally equal way, um, that we can try to speak to each other through logic and so on, rather than um, reducing everything to someone's accidents of birth and all of that. The fact that so many people are are still reduced to that is not a reason to you know expand and democratize that reduction it's a reason to get rid of it um, to make equality real but but there's a simple rule that goes a long way towards achieving that people have freedom of expression and that is to have freedom of expression if the individual has that right and that right is protected then that goes a long way I mean, if, 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 if large corporations cannot censor you in social media and, and that, that is illegal and the, and the government protects you against that and so on, having that fundamental right of the individual 
goes a long way in this direction. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm, a, I, I hate making up new rules. You know, oh, I'm always it's an old rule. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like when you say some such and such should be illegal, um, that's just, I mean, well, what, what I mean is, well, um, you, since you're normally, if you have a right in in a legal system, if you have a right then it means that if if someone is uh, offending that right that the state you can there's tools available where you can defend yourself to defend that right that's all i mean i don't i mm -hmm. don't mean that there needs to be new uh laws i, I think mm -hmm. i think just that if we applied that principle we'd be we'd be a long way towards having a better society well i think also that um movements need to be a little bit more careful about calling specifically for censorship I think we've got to a point now where we start to see everything as downstream from culture. So culture gets this sort of, instead of culture being a re reflecting something, it's seen as causing something. So, you know, you could do, like I do, discourse analysis. That's what I do. That's what my research is. Um, but I don't see discourse as necessarily causing something. I see it as reflecting things that are much, much deeper. And therefore, I wouldn't, just because I think that the way that we frame an issue, you know, subtly uh, invites us to interpret things in a particular way, I wouldn't then say, therefore, you should prevent it from framing an issue in that way. I'm yeah. saying it is reflecting something and I'm trying to show that underlying thing that it's reflecting and that we can understand it in this different way. So my response is more ideas, more language, more, you know, ways of talking yes. about an issue. And, and that's a very... amongst ideas. Yeah, um, it's a powerful understanding or it's a powerful uh, proposition to say, well, the, these expressions are reflecting something. They're not causing something. But it's almost like you're trying to um, argue for freedom of expression. You're trying to justify that freedom of expression uh, should arise. You're saying, look, th what this expression is reflecting what's out there in society. It's not actually causing harm. And, and um, it's sad, I think, that we have to justify freedom of expression, whereas not long ago it was understood that it was an essential feature of a stable democratic society that you had to have freedom of expression. You know what I mean? Yeah, we've we've I mean, kind of left that behind and we're, we're now justifying that we shouldn't have as much censorship as we do. I mean, uh, for me, that's a that's a, a wrong turn in societal structure, if you like. And that, yeah, that's yeah. why I, I was I was that's why I want to come back to this. Cancer culture is toxic. Mm -hmm. I think that if you have a cancer culture, it actually harms society. Could you speak to that? Uh, is that is that how you meant it? Yeah, yeah, because we, we're not really able to move conversations forward if everything that you say has to be perfectly polished. I mean, I was actually talking about this with a friend recently about um, Lawrence Fox. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this whole um, Ferrari that's erupted in the UK with this actor who quoted Martin Luther James. Martin Luther James, Martin Luther King, bleh, Martin Luther King on... Um, on uh, on on the BBC. Um, anyway, so he, he then after this he became he was all doing this sort of talk show circuit, and um, he uh, said something that was quite silly and wrong, and just wrong, just factually incorrect. And my friend texted me and said, "Oh, that's it for him." And I thought, "Well, wait a minute now." You know, you know, I I will debate people. I debate people constantly with whom I completely and fundamentally disagree, and I enjoy it. And sometimes I lose, um, and sometimes I win. But I always come back with better arguments because I go home and I think about what was said, and I think, oh, you know, I should have said that. Um, but sometimes I'm wrong, and the only way that I can tell that I'm wrong is by debating with somebody. And then I realize I'm wrong and I change my arguments and I think about it and so on. And I go another direction. This idea that you can never say anything wrong in public life is terrible. And it really holds back the discussions that we need to have. The only way that we move forward um, per and we progress intellectually is through being wrong, through discovering our errors and hopefully correcting them. Um, so I, in that but, but way, I, it's I, extraordinarily I, toxic. I would argue that you're explaining why we have to try to tamper or move away from the animal reaction known as mobbing. I mean, we're, we're, we're in such a heightened state of uh, feeling that we're in danger and that things are fragile and we have to defend our space and so on, that we're par prepared to, pre to participate in mobbing anyone if they do something incorrectly.
And so the, the, the mobbing reaction is very strong in our society. And we just, we, we take people out and then they're gone. They can never come back, as you say. But I think that's, that's it's known in birds, it's known in, in many social animals, virtually all social animals will mob. But I think the mobbing reaction is stronger in a more stressed society, in a society that's more oppressed by totalitarianism and so on, then it's very strong. So I think we need to understand that mobbing reaction in those terms as well. What do you think of that? Um, I would say that the only way that we can understand um, what's going on here uh, is, well, I, obviously there are no monocausal explanations, but I think one of the most important uh, uh, explanations is through our underlying understandings of subjectivity and what it means to be human. And I think that has a profound effect on the reason why we want to shut down incorrect what we think of or want to believe <laughs> is incorrect speech or, or mistakes and we why we cancel people when they make mistakes. Um, you have to have a very robust understanding of what it means to be a human subject living in a democracy in order to have an idea that you can hear something that's incorrect and not be like a Pavlovian dog that salivates at the sound of a bell, you know, oh, this person said this, I'm going to go out and go nuts, you know, um, you, that you can hear ideas and think about them and reflect and, and choose how to act. That idea is just sort of gone. Um, and we now think of people as this sort of the, the mass, mass society as this like... Um, um, this sort of seething throng, um, people who can't be reasoned with are not in possession of reason. And I think it's really interesting because there's, you know, if you look at our cultural metaphors, um, what is the, the monster of our movies of our times? It's a zombie, right? It's this idea of this mass, this slow moving um, horde, slowly coming for the last people who think. <laughs> and that's kind of our understanding of what it means to be human. And if you have that understanding of the human subject, it's impossible to have a belief in democracy, to have a belief that you can have robust debate where people are wrong sometimes and they say things that are incorrect because you don't believe that people have a capacity able to reflect on those things and therefore you think they have to be protected. It is very important the idea of the subject that, that we have in society because if we have an idea of the human subject as vulnerable then the goal is safety, well-being and protection. Freedom yeah. is not something that we would strive for, it's a problem. It's right. something that needs but, but to be clamped in, down in, on. In what you've said you're, you're basically in a sense, you're arguing that we need to use cognitive psychology on ourselves to kind of reason with ourselves that we shouldn't be participating in mobbing, that we shouldn't feel overly insecure when we hear something, that we shouldn't respond to uh, to words as though they were threatening and so on. You're kind of arguing that we need a, um, um, a social theory of ourselves where we're able to be cognitive of these, of, of this, of this, uh, to, to damp to dampen our reactions to words, basically. That's kind of what I'm hearing. And um, and I may be wrong. <laughs> no, I, but, I don't think so, because if you think about the people who are doing the mobbing, mm -hmm. they are usually not doing it on behalf of themselves. They're doing it on behalf of some other, right? So they will say, yes, I have a capacity to reflect. I am not going to go and uh, you know throw rocks through windows. But what about them out there? They're trying to protect some other, uh, or they're offended on behalf of some other. Oh, I see what um, you mean. So it's, it's, it's about, that's why I say that the, it's this idea of the human subject that underlies it, because they think, what about them out there? And pe people say that to me all the time, where right. I, oh, I'll like talk about, you know, um, different ways of understanding human psychology that exists in different cultures, and say, uh, and I'll, you know, give a little anecdote about, um, you know, what it was like growing up in therapy culture and so on and say, okay, Ashley, you know, that's you. You've got that capacity to reflect. Good for you. But most people don't. Right. I, I, I think I think I understand. You. You're, you're basically saying we need to be worried and we need to be politically correct because there's a mass out there and think about how they'll respond to this or how they'll react to this. I guess that's what you're saying. Huh? Exactly. That's, like this, that's this idea that we're, we're in an ocean of this of this zombie-like reaction to what might happen. Therefore, we have to be careful. Therefore, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that, that is... Yeah. That is uh, and that's probably, I mean, usually when I get flack, that's what people are saying. Okay, yes, I get what you're saying, but those people out there, they're going to misinterpret it, right? So you ha always have to be careful. And we can't, sometimes we can't even just tell the truth. Um, and but I've it, seen... It, 
it, but it sounds like it's just another uh, pretext to uh, find that censorship is, accept is acceptable. It, it sounds like it's one of these constructs to justify censorship, right? Mm -hmm. And there are many such constructs. But I, I keep coming back, especially with the Ontario Civil Liberties Association, we keep coming back to this idea that expression is a fundamental human right of the individual and that it, it needs to be recognized as such. We need to protect it fiercely and we need to protect those that are being censored uh, uh, by a, a, a large strong body such as a state or a large corporation that gets state privileges. We need to protect individuals from that censorship. That's kind of our position and our what we feel is our mission in society. Um, but uh, so, I, so we're very interested in your work. Um, how did you come to become very involved in social commentary on social media? And how do you blend that with your academic work? How does it fit uh, in? How does uh, it fit with, in? With great difficulty. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, when I did my PhD, I wanted to be a public intellectual. I, I then gave up on that because I didn't, I don't think I'm smart enough. And I just be totally honest about that. Like I said, I get things wrong. You know, I make mistakes and we're at a point now where you can't make mistakes. You can't say anything wrong in public life. And I think that's really scary. Um, and so actually I didn't want to be a public intellectual. I didn't want to be a social media commentator. Um, I'm actually quite uh, fearful because I have um, two young children. I've got a 19 month old and a three year old and I'm the only one who's providing for my family. And I have had people, um, you know, try to call up, you know, to threaten to like talk to my boss. And <laughs> it's like, it's funny because these people think of themselves as leftist, right? I'm a Marxist. Like, I will be totally honest. I am a Marxist. And the idea that you could think of it as progressive to try to get somebody fired is so shockingly backward. And it, but anyways, um, so I didn't really want to do this because of that kind of headache. Um, but I have a, I have a very good friend who um you know really has always really liked my work and uh you know reads my papers and that kind of thing he said you know i always did a lot of um tv stuff I, you know once you know once a producer gets your name they pass it around and then they're always calling you and i never made clips or anything and he gathered together all, all my clips and um made all of these clips for me um and so he's the one who got in got into doing that and then these clips sort of just went all over the place and like I checked when they had a hundred thousand views and I was really shocked by that um so that's kind of how I've been um kind of pulled into <laughs> pulled into this sort of thing but I, I'm not that I, I'm not that brave I, you know I'm not there are people who are I I think are just extraordinarily brave and who I really really admire I was I was a total coward I just thought you know I, I've got to think about myself here, <laughs> but no, um, I think it's an important time to kind of stick your neck out as well. And I've stuck my neck out around some really, really contentious issues and I've got a lot of flack for it. And I can, you know, I can understand it. Like you have to be very careful in thinking that the media represents public opinion or Twitter represents public opinion. It does not. And if mm -hmm. you get pulled into that world, you can easily start to convince yourself of some pretty crazy things. Um, but luckily, you know, I, uh, my family, my family's from Ontario, actually, from Sudbury. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're very sort of down to earth kind of people, working class people. And, uh, you know, I never want to get into a, a situation where I just want to say things to please the commentariat. You know, I... Uh, was an activist when I was younger because I wanted to make life better for people, not because I wanted to educate people and make them think the right things, but because I believe that it, we can have a world that is materially richer and better. Uh, we have the ability to do that. And I am frustrated that we are not doing that and that we're stuck in this endless culture war. And I'm kind of wary of, of being pulled into it myself. Um, but at the same time, I think without an understanding of the subject as open, as, you know, far less determined than we're led to believe, um, you know, I mean, we have to have a more open idea of the subject because without that, we're not going to have a more open idea of what the future could be. Because mm -hmm. if we have that kind of closed, determined 
idea of the subject that we're just like acting on impulse and dominated by, you know, um, forces uh, nine tenths below the surface, then it's impossible to think that we could have a completely different future. It's just like, well, the way things are today is because of human human nature and ever it shall be. And then we're just kind of locked in the present. You, you're, you're, you've given yourself a huge task. I can see that you're fundamentally as a person, given your working class background and so on, you're, you're, you're interested in injustice and you, you're, you're bothered by injustice and there's a lot of it in the world. But, um, and, and, and you're trying to position yourself in order to solve that problem. And I, I have to say that we at Oak Club, we, we really admire your, your outings in social media where you try to explain the importance of recognizing that certain behaviors are toxic and the importance of allowing people to have platforms and considering, as you explained today, that it's about it's reflecting something. It's not causing harm. So we I have to say we really appreciate your work and we want to thank you for this this interview today. Um, do, do, do you have a closing comment you would like to make? Um, yeah, um, I think that um, we have to go back to an idea of public debate where we can handle hearing things that might be wrong, might even be offensive. <laughs> um, because if we don't actually hear people out, we will never know what people actually think. Um, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. You don't get rid of ideas by censoring them. You just push them underground. Um, I have... I've actually I've learned so much from reading terrible stuff from uh, knowing what my enemies think, what they truly believe um, and being honest with myself. Can I defeat these arguments? And if I can't, then I need to go back to the books. Uh, it's hard. It's difficult. But that's what makes public life so important and freedom of expression so important. Thank you very much for this, Ashley. That was great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.